Okay, so we're recording now. So welcome to What the F is going on in Latin America, Code Pink's weekly YouTube program of hot news out of Latin America and the Caribbean. We broadcast every Wednesday on Code Pink YouTube, normally 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Today, we are speaking with you live from Quito, Ecuador. And I am joined by Code Pink's Leonardo Flores. Leonardo and I are both um, Latin America campaign coordinators for Code Pink. And we are currently in Quito, um, having uh, served as international election observers on Sunday, April 11th, which was the second round of presidential elections, second and final round of the presidential elections here in Ecuador. It was a runoff between the neoliberal candidate Guillermo Lasso and the Citizens Revolution candidate Andres Arauz. Results were Lasso 52.51%, Arauz 47.49%. So welcome, Leo. Let's talk a little bit about what happened on Sunday. Thanks, Terry. It's good to be here. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, as a Code Pink delegation, electoral observer, observation delegation, we didn't witness any sort of irregularities and nothing major, of course. Uh, I would say that the vote itself on Sunday and the vote count on, on Sunday, April 11th, uh, was fair. You know, there was no fraud involved at all on that day. The problem, of course, comes before the vote. Uh, in the months leading up to, up to the you know, first round and, and then in between the first and second rounds, there were many things that were that were indicative of a, an uneven, uneven playing field between the, the various candidates. And I think that really is the determining factor in the loss for Andres Arauz of the progressive UNES party. Um, otherwise, I think he, he might have been able to win. So UNES is a, is a new party or basically a coalition of parties. Um, Arauz uh, is, was running as um, an inheritor of Correismo or Rafael, President Rafael Correa's um, Citizens Revolution project uh, for development of the people of Ecuador versus the capitalists of Ecuador. And I, I, I totally agree with you. There was a lot, the, the elections on Sunday were very clean. It, it was a very normal, peaceful election process. But of course, there's all the intangible things, all the campaign issues, all the lawfare issues that observers are not witness to on the actual day of election. So all those factors that run up um, to the day of election, all those factors that comprise who candidates can and cannot be and what their campaign looks like. So with Arauz, he was denied the use of Correa's image uh, during the campaign. Um, Correa himself was denied running as Arauz's vice president. And um, Correa's party, Alianza País, uh, no longer exists. And so UNES was created. So there were, for our, for our um, viewers, for our audience, there's um, a lot of background that led up to the results. And in, I think in one way, I think you would agree with this, in one way, it's amazing what Arauz was able to accomplish since last fall, 47% with all those strikes against him. And yet, um, let's, so let's talk a little bit about- yeah, I mean, I think to understand, the res to, to understand the results, we actually have to go back four years to 2017, when again, Guillermo Lasso was the candidate and the candidate for Correismo, this movement behind former President Rafael Correa, who was in power for 10 years, 2007 to 2017. He brought economic growth to Ecuador, told political stability. Prior to Correa, Ecuador had had seven presidents in 10 years and a, an economy that was so battered that you saw massive amounts of migration outside of Ecuador. So Moreno is kind of seen as the inheritor of this movement, Correismo, but as soon as he wins those elections, it becomes a total bait and switch, almost like a silent coup. What, and, and what happened was that Moreno basically adopted all of the policies and programs that were put forward by his opponent in those same elections, Guillermo Lasso. So he starts this kind of neoliberal uh, push and a push for austerity, and he begins destroying the institutions that had been created during the during the during the Correa years. And you know, the first thing, the, one of the first whistleblowers of, of everything was uh, the vice president Jorge Glass. He blows the whistle. He says, "Look." The president is now on the side of the bankers. He's completely betrayed the people's movement. Uh, and and for, his, for doing this, for taking his stance, 
Jorge Glass is one of the first people to face political persecution in this country under the Moreno government, and he's still in jail today. He's one of the most important political prisoners in Latin America, only we don't hear much about him. And then the, the campaign against Jorge Glass, is, then it becomes expanded to, and they start going after other leaders of Correismo, including Rafael Correa himself, who has something like 30 cases uh, pending against them. Uh, I mean, some of them are totally absurd. In one of them, he's accused of psychic corruption, or excuse me, psychic influence. Influence. To, you know, <laughs> psychic influence to, to make it, to make other people corrupt. And so that's kind of the lead up to these elections uh, where you had this betrayal of the citizens' revolution, as the Correismo is also called, by Lenin Moreno, who adopts all of uh, Guillermo Lasso's policies. And then in October 2019, the people couldn't take it anymore. There was a massive uprising in Ecuador that was brutally repressed by Naming Moreno, 11 people died, uh, and Guillermo Lasso, you know, cheered this on. And when the, the main kind of the, the spark that lit the flame was a, a, an elimination of fuel subsidies stemming from a deal with, for, with the IMF that kind of harkens back to the days of the Washington Consensus with off, imposed austerity and deregulation and really uh, uh, an eroding of labor rights. And so, yeah, as you said, you know, Correismo tried to recover from this. They put forward this really young candidate Andres Arauz, who's 36 years old, but he's also a brilliant economist. He had already been director of the central bank. Uh, he was one of the people kind of responsible for that, the, the way that Ecuador had managed to uh, weather the storm of the collapse in oil prices in 2015, because 50% of Ecuador's revenue comes from oil. Um, so as you said, his, the actual original party, Alianza País, was no longer there. They tried to create a new party, but were refused by the CNE. Then they finally kind of uh, got this small party to adopt Andres, Arrea, Andres Arauz as the as the candidate. Uh, and the, the the kind of lawfare and the campaign, you know, ugliness didn't stop there. There was so much fake news going against Andres Arauz. He was accused of wanting to de-dollarize uh, Ecuador. Ecuador has been on using the US dollar for about 20 years. It was the only thing that stabilized the economy. And Arauz understands this and he kind of supports this. He, you know, there are pros and cons, but it has stabilized Ecuador's economy. There was also this crazy allegation that Andres Arauz is financed by left-wing guerrillas in Colombia. Uh, this was disproved by an ornithologist because they used this video that was very obviously uh, taped in Southern Ecuador where this bird lives that doesn't live in, in Colombia. And an ornithologist picked it out of the video, uh, these sounds and kind of uh, destroyed that narrative. But I think the damage was done, uh, especially because there were, you know, the, the media here in Ecuador is totally corporate and it was completely on the side of the banker, Guillermo Lasso, who's one of the richest people in the country. And, and Arauz didn't really have a fair shot uh, going into these elections. So Arauz, let's talk a little bit about who Andres Arauz is, because you and I went to a uh, rally uh, third, last Thursday evening, which was, Thursday was the last legal day to campaign, and we went to basically a closing rally for the Arauz campaign and talked to a lot of people there. One of the, one of the gentlemen I spoke with, uh, older, my age, older, <laughs> and um, he, one of the key enticements for voting for a rouse for him was the fact that the candidate was 36 years old that was and an economist both of those things it was so the youth the young, representing a new generation new face new uh, approach to things was very appealing to a lot of people and yet this older neoliberal banker who has run now three four times and finally won uh is going to be the new president of Ecuador. Yeah, and I think uh, as observers, we talked to a lot of voters after they, they voted and to kind of hear out what, you know, what how they felt about these elections. First of all, nobody has confidence in in Ecuador's electoral system. Uh, voter after voter said, you know, oh, I'm going to I'm going to voting for Lasso. I mean, we were in a heavily Lasso area. They said, I'm going to vote for Lasso, but I think they're going to steal the elections from us. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and you know, yeah, and, and voters also talked about they, they were going to vote for Lasso because he represented change. And that was really striking to me because Lasso has basically been the shadow president for the past four years. So the Lasso campaign managed to make it seem like Moreno was actually a continuation of Correa and that Arauz would be a continuation of Moreno. And Moreno was wildly, wildly unpopular. He has somewhere between four to seven percent approval ratings. 
Uh, so that was a kind of a really big deal that that the Lasso campaign was able to distance itself from Moreno and actually push Arauz and, and kind of wed him to Moreno. And that's the, uh, really a result, of, as I was mentioning earlier, of this uh, the, of, the, of the, the work the media done, had done, the, the corporate media. Uh, so and, it was really and quite social media. And social media as well, really. I mean, in the days, you know, just prior to the election, uh, a lasso and lasso talking points were trending here in Ecuador, and there was very little to suggest that Arauz, uh, you know, had, even had a major media, social media presence. And really, I think that's part of a kind of these troll farms that we've been seeing employed by right wing, uh, you know, politicians throughout Latin, Latin America, you know, whether it's Facebook, Twitter or other social media accounts that they have, you know, basically these centers with, uh, you know, base bots, basically, you know, pushing their the, this narrative. Uh, and so I think Lasso was able to capitalize quite a bit on that. And, uh, and that house, uh, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, their campaign didn't have an answer. So let, let's, let's talk about um, two things. What, what did you and I hear? Uh, we attended a lot of auxiliary meetings. We were, we attended a lot of formal um, CNE meetings, uh, basically for training and for you know, what's unique to Ecuador, things we needed to know on, on, on election day. But we also um, attended quite a few auxiliary meetings pre-election day and post-election day. What do you think are the most important things the Arouse campaign learned from this, but not, not just the Arouse campaign, but the movement, the citizens revolution, the whole philosophy that was brought to the Arouse campaign? Yeah, I mean, I think the primary reason at our loss is what we've already discussed, how, how the level playing field was uneven. But one of the other big factors was this kind of uh, schism between CONAI, the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, and the Citizens Revolution. They'd been at odds for years, and really there was kind of bad blood. I mean, the, the head of CONAI had said he would never even sit down to speak with Rafael Correa, but he was open to speaking to Andres Sadaus, and he actually endorsed Andres Sadaus just about a week before the election. Unfortunately, it was too little too late, and so you had this big block of voters, uh, many of whom are on the left because, you know, this, this indigenous uh, confederation isn't fully left, but it's kind of a big tent of, of various organizations, uh, and, but many of them do belong to the left. And it has this, this Gonai also has a political wing called Pachacutic. And Pachacutic, the candidate came in third in place in the runoff elections that were held earlier this year, Yaku Perez. He's a guy who talks a big game about eco-socialism and women's rights, but he's very much in the neoliberal camp. Uh, he supported Lasso in 2017. He supports this deal with the IMF. Uh, that's really going to cripple, uh, uh, harm uh, Ecuador's economy over the next de decade, perhaps. And so because of this schism, you had a lot of voters vote null or blank. So in Ecuador, voting is compulsory, obligatory. But so voters who don't like any of the candidates either leave their vote blank or they spoil their ba ballot, which is called the null vote. In the first round of the election, out of 13 million voters, 1.3 million voted either null or blank. In the second round, that number grew to 1.9 million. Uh, so there, you had a 6,000 vote increase in the invalid votes when the difference between Lasso and Arauz in the second round was 400,000 votes. So they, that also played a, a very key role in this. And you know, I think going forward, uh, the challenge for the left in Ecuador is going to, you know, find a is having finding a way for Conai and and the Citizens Revolution to work together. But not only that, I think the Citizens Revolution has to do a lot of work in terms of building its social base in terms of, you know, training, uh, uh, you know, le local leaders to become national leaders and local leaders to be able to organize more efficiently. I think there was a, a lack of emphasis on that. And, and it, in one, some ways we can understand it because Correismo prior to Sunday, April 11th had won 14 elections in a row. So, you know, they were pretty confident that what they were doing was working, but unfortunately, you know, everything has changed in the past four years in terms of the social relations in Ecuador because of this austerity. And of course, the pandemic, uh, we can't talk about these elections without mention the, mentioning the pandemic where Ecuador has been one of the worst performers in the world. You know, we walk around the city here uh, and it's really so it's quiet. Dead. Oh, yeah, dead is not the right word to use. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very, I mean, very quiet. It, I mean, it's very clear that it's an, it, there's an economic crisis and the pandemic on top of that, and then and people are just you know they don't know what to do. Uh, so it, it's very lots of challenges that Ecuador faces right now. A couple, there's two things I 
want to just interject for the audience just technical things about the elections that are unique and kind of a curiosity from those of us from the states. Um, you mentioned that uh, voting is compulsory. So by law, people do have to vote and um, elections are held on Sunday so that people can com conform to the law. Six, you can start voting as a 16 year old, 16, 17, until your 18th birthday, you can participate in the elections, it's optional. But once you are legally 18, you are um, a full adult under the law and you are required to vote. And also, uh, there is a large participation of Ecuadorians living in the diaspora. They vote. They are also um, allowed to hold a seat in the National Assembly. So that so they can not just vote, but they can participate in the government living in the diaspora. So those are two really unique things to Ecuador that I found really uh, compelling and very encouraging to get young people to start voting at 16. I thought that was a really um, fascinating way to start pulling people into the to the process. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I do think it's great that that migrants have a, are going to have a say in, in their National Assembly. Uh, another curious thing is that they split the voting into kind of men and women. So you go into a polling center and then the polling tables themselves are either reserved for men or women. And there's kind of a they you know each split up into different lines. And we asked several people why. And the main reason seems to be that this way women can feel more comfortable voting because you know, that way you prevent men from, you know, being kind of aggressive or harassing them in line and kind of intimidating them into voting for a certain candidate. Uh, so for us, it was kind of unique, but but I think the people of Ecuador really uh, support that. So uh, let's, um, why don't we wrap up with talking about what Sunday's election results could possibly mean for the region. And then also in one of our auxiliary meetings with the Consul General of uh, Venezuela, we kind of had a debrief yesterday. And the, um, the, we talked about the Asia Pacific Rim and as being um, of what the results of Sunday's elections, how they will affect the Asia Pacific Rim. And I still, you know, foolishly, sitting principally having lived in California, look, you know, west across the Pacific and think, well, the Asia Pacific Rim is China, Japan, you know, but of course the Asia Pacific Rim is California and Chile also. And we yeah, have elections, the, the presidential Americans elections in Chile. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about the, the potential regional repercussions of Sunday's results. Yeah, I mean, it would be the Americas Pacific Rim in this case. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's correct. <laughs> And so, yeah, I, I mean, if, if Andres Arauz had made it clear that if he were to win, he was going to re, uh, reinstitute Ecuador into UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations, and into CELAC, the Community of Latin American and Caribbean States, which are two multilateral organizations that are really serve, aimed to serve as a counterweight to the OAS, the Organization of American States. The OAS can only really be understood as a tool of the State Department uh, as a way for uh, the U.S. to get its way in, in all of the hemisphere. And so the CELAC was created specifically to counter that. And UNASUR was created to, to serve as kind of the, the starting point for greater South American integration. It was kind of the, the, the idea was for South America to become almost like the EU, uh, slightly differently organized, of course. And then when Moreno came into power, he withdraws Ecuador from UNASUR. Unfortunately, the headquarters of UNASUR is in Ecuador. So the, the organization took a big hit. And what we heard from uh, an expert here was that if UNASUR had still been you know, going strong, when the pandemic hit, it would have saved thousands of lives throughout South America because the governments would have been able to coordinate, would have been able to coordinate health policies together, and the governments would have been able to form a block to buy vaccines together, which would have been very important. Here in Ecuador, they're just starting the vaccines. There's actually several scandals about vaccines right now. Uh, so unfortunately, the, you know, this decline in UNESCO has actually caused deaths. And Lasso is not going to return to UNESCO. In fact, Lasso is going to continue this policy of uh, attempted regime change in Venezuela. One of the first people to congratulate him was the so-called interim president of Venezuela, Juan Guaido. And Lasso kind of responded and invited him to his inauguration. And in terms of the Pacific, I think, you know, uh, this is kind of a plan by the United States to, to have this kind of uh, uh, a free trade area all, all along the Pacific coast. And so Ecuador is now firmly in the camp that will, will very likely sign this free trade agreement. Uh, of course, Colombia, and then next year, or this year rather, we have uh, upcoming elections in Peru and Chile. And so those are gonna be very key in, geopolitically to see what happens. Uh, I think if 
you know, some of the sail, the wind was taken out of the sails of the kind of the, the resurgence of the pink tide. The pink tide refers to this period in the early 2000s when you had progressive government after progressive government take power throughout Latin America. Then it kind of died away in the 2010s in part because of U.S. pressure and, and coups, of course. And, and with the Bolivian elections last year, we thought we would see a resurgence of the pink tide. Ecuador, the loss here now kind of, you know, makes that a little harder to achieve. But of course, we have Lula in Brazil, most likely being the candidate next year, and other left-wing candidates in many other countries. So a lot, to, a lot's going to be at stake in the next uh, elections here in South America. Well, we've got a lot of work to do in in helping lift these voices and people looking to change and doing something more socially constructive with their economies and their governments. On the Pacific Rim, we also have Nicaragua presidential elections in um, in November. So Nicaragua, Chile, Brazil. Uh, who else in November? Honduras. <laughs> so, um, so a lot, a lot. Uh, we could be looking at a really quite different and exciting um, region by the end of this year. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm going to let you go. If people can see uh, the sun is starting to set here in Quito. I just kind of wanted all of you to see we actually are here, <laughs> and the mountains are particularly beautiful. Um, also. I want to remind all of you that this is um, What the F is going on in Latin America. We broadcast every Wednesday, 4.30 p.m. Pacific, 7.30 p.m. Um, Eastern on Code Pink YouTube. And also be sure to catch Code Pink Radio every Thursday morning, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific on WBAI New York City and WPFW Washington, D.C., both Pacifica radio stations. So thank you again, Leo. It's been a pleasure to be working here on the ground with Keto in Keto with you for the past week. So likewise, Terry, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Bye everyone.